All right. How are you, Sander? Good, thank you. Good. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you, we can see you. Great. <laughs> Welcome uh, to the Soil Nutrition Conference. Been thank one of the years. Um, sorry, it'll, sorry it has to be in, in the virtual space, but uh, great to have you. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, your <laughs> reputation precedes you, but we're looking forward to what you have to say about fermentation. And I think maybe a few practical uh, suggestions today, harvesting things from the ecosystem and um, external ecosystem to support the internal ecosystem. Um, and we'll plan to have you present for about an hour and then, and then go to question and answer for half an hour. Great. All right, take it away. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me uh, uh, be be part of this. Um, uh, I hope people have have, have questions because I, I I actually probably will um, uh, not take up a full hour, but people always have lots of questions. So um, you know, rather rather than just uh, you know I'm, I'm talking about what I want to talk about, I love to hear what people are thinking about. And you know, fermentation is a realm of everybody's life which is, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, mystified for people. Um, so, um, you know, my mission is to demystify this process. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, basically give an overview, beginning with the question, what is fermentation? Um, and, you know, why do people practice fermentation everywhere? Um, and then I'm going to try to relate it to soil biodiversity and, um, uh, uh, you know, talk about some, um, you know, practical aspects of, of fermentation. And, um, you know, then, then we will see what people um, are interested in. Um, so I'm speaking to you from um, my home in Middle Tennessee. Um, the cucumbers are just coming in in my garden. And so it's about to be a busy fermentation time for me. Um, but let me let me start by addressing this you know broad question what is fermentation anyway broadly speaking i would define fermentation as the transformative action of microorganisms um if we have any biologists watching um you might already be shaking your heads because um you know the way a biologist would define fermentation is anaerobic metabolism the production of energy without oxygen and you know most of the foods and beverages that we describe as fermented would meet the biologist definition but not all of them um uh you know certain microbially transformed foods that we regularly describe as fermented are fermented by organisms that require oxygen. They're aerobic organisms. And, um, you know, I, I think of these sometimes as the oxymoronic ferments because they are the microbially transformed foods and beverages that actually contradict a biologist's understanding of fermentation. Um, so some examples of this would be kombucha, um, you know, the, 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 the beverage that so many people are drinking. The, the organisms that transform sweet tea into kombucha include aerobic organisms that require oxygen. Um, some of those organisms are vinegar organisms. So vinegar is another example of a, 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 a microbially transformed fermentation that requires oxygen. So, um, you know, this is why I prefer to sort of depart from the biologist definition and work with a broader lay definition that fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. And yet not every transformative action of microorganisms we would describe as fermentation. So for instance, you know, if you are cleaning your refrigerator and you find a, a bag of parsley that got hidden in the back of your vegetable drawer that has uh, uh, begun to liquefy, you know, you don't pull out that bag of um, decomposing parsley and say, oh, look, the parsley started to ferment. Let's, let's eat it. No, we have a whole other vocabulary to describe this. We call it decomposing or maybe rotting or spoiled. But generally, we reserve the word fermentation to describe intentional or desirable microbial transformations. But, you know, I think the fact that you know, we all inevitably encounter um, decomposing food in our refrigerators, in our pantries, 
can give us some insight into the inevitability of microbial transformation of our food. And, you know, unless food is dried, so there's no water in it that can support microbial life, or unless the food is frozen, so it's kept at a temperature um, um, where microbial life cannot be active, um, you know, or unless we, um, um, you know, create a vacuum, a sterile environment, as in the example of canning, or unless we use chemicals that prevent uh, preservatives that, you know, prevent uh, uh, these organisms from functioning, you know, microbial transformation of our food is more or less inevitable. Um, fermentation is practiced everywhere. And, um, you know, my, my idea about the reason why fermentation is practiced everywhere is this inevitability. You know, microbial change happens to, to food. Now, the reality is that nothing we eat is ever populated by one singular microorganism. Um, you know, there is great biodiversity on, you know, the plants and the animal products that make up our food. And so, you know, the big question in fermentation is which organisms are going to grow? And, you know, the practice of fermentation is all about manipulating environments uh, uh, in ways that have the effect of encouraging the growth of certain kinds of microorganisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other type of organisms. And, you know, one aspect of this, which is just fascinating to me, is that, you know, humans have really only specifically known of the existence of microorganisms for about 150 years. Uh, Louis Pasteur is credited with, um, you know, identifying uh, microorganisms definitively as the agents of, of fermentation and beginning to distinguish between different types of microorganisms. And yet, um, you know, there's evidence that human cultures in every part of the world have been working with fermentation for at least 100, uh, at least 10,000 years, uh, uh, you know, according to the archaeological record. And, you know, that has to do with the age of pottery shards that have uh, a residue of alcohol. But, you know, I would say that that really only gives us insight into the history of pottery because the, you know, the, the earlier uh, fermentation vessels would have all been biodegradable, such as gourds or animal membranes or um, you know, hollowed out wooden vessels or you know, things like that that would not uh, 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 stick around for 10,000 years. So um, you know, fermentation really is a, it's a natural phenomenon. It's not something that humans invented. Um, and you know, if anyone has harvested a lot of fruit, um, you know, you'll always find some, you know, damaged berries or apples that have already begun to ferment um, because, you know, there are, there are yeasts that find their way to, um, you know, all, uh, uh, all fruits, all foods that have uh, uh, sugars that could feed yeast. But, you know, while the food, while the fruit is intact, the yeast can't access uh, 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 the nutrients, but as soon as it's damaged, then they can begin to access the nutrients and ferment the sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Um, so, you know, fermentation is a natural process that happens without us or with us. And, you know, where, where, um, um, you know, human, uh, cleverness and innovation, uh, uh, you know, comes in is in creating vessels and creating methodologies. But all of these methodologies were developed without specifically knowing about fermentation, simply by observing and trial and error. Um, you know, people figured out under what conditions would the food improve in some way. Would it become more stable for storage? Would it produce alcohol? Would it become more flavorful? Would, be, would it become more easily digestible? Would some toxic or bitter compound be removed from the food? Um, and at the same time, the food is not decomposing. So, um, um, you know, by creating these environments, people figured out, you know, methodologies to encourage the growth, what we would now recognize as encouraging the growth of the organisms that are desirable, that give us the um, uh, practical benefits that we desire, and at the same time, um, um, preventing the activity um, discouraging, inhibiting the activity 
of the organisms that either you know decompose the food in in ways that are not pleasing to us that create off flavors that we don't like um you know or in some cases that would create um um you know toxins or organisms that could make us sick um so you know pathogenic foods um you know, let me really stress that fermentation is a strategy for safety in food. Um, you know, particularly in the fermentation of um, raw plant material, uh, uh, vegetables and fruits, you know, there is no case history of, um, uh, of food poisoning or illness from, from um, um, fermented uh, uh, raw fruits or vegetables. Um, you know, the, the, the processes are really intrinsically safe because the acids that are produced when you ferment vegetables spontaneously and the alcohol that is uh, produced when you ferment sugary fruits spontaneously, both inhibit the growth of the kinds of organisms that can make us sick. So even if there happen to be cells of pathogenic bacteria that could potentially make us sick, you know, on some vegetables or some fruit that are fermented, the byproducts of the organisms which will dominate um, um, end up inhibiting any of the organisms that are associated with uh, uh, food poisoning. And so, you know, although in our time, because bacteria have become so closely associated with um, disease and um, uh, danger and death, um, you know, people project their fear of bacteria onto the idea of, of, of fermentation. But, you know, in fact, fermentation is a strategy for safety in food and has a really, really excellent track record. Um, so, so fermentation is, is ancient, um, uh, it, you know, at least 10,000 years old. And I mean, in fact, there, there's even evidence that, um, that primates, that lots of different kinds of um, animals, insects, birds, um, are drawn to the smell and the flavor of certain spontaneously fermenting uh, uh, foods. Um, and, um, you know, fermentation is, is so old that it's prehistoric. Like nobody really knows the specific origin of, of almost any fermented food or beverage because they're so ancient. They, you know, predate written records. Um, and all we have is, you know, vague uh, geographic ideas of where some of the fermentation traditions um, um, originate. And fermentation is practiced everywhere. I mean, I do not possess encyclopedic knowledge, um, but I mean, certainly in every region of the world, fermentation is practiced. And, you know, every counterexample that anyone has offered to me over the last 25 years since I got obsessed with all things fermented, um, um, you know, people, people used to tell me that, um, um, you know, the indigenous people of Australia uh, uh, had no fermentation techniques. My first visit to Australia, um, I went on a wild foods walk and there was a, there, there was a nut tree and the, the nuts were on the ground and um, the Aboriginal elder who was um, uh, leading the, 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 the walk said, don't eat them. They're poisonous. You have to soak them in water for three or four days before they become safe to eat. Well, guess what happens when you soak a dry food in water for a few days? Um, it activates dormant microorganisms that are present but unable to function because they don't have the water to do so. Once you um, um, put them in water, then suddenly they have water, they can come to life, they can access nutrients that are present in the nut and break down toxic compounds into benign safe forms. So, you know, fermentation is, is practiced um, um, everywhere. Um, and, you know, it would be really difficult for, I mean, I, I guess in a, it, it, it's conceivable that in a hunter-gatherer situation, if people are collecting the food each day that are going to get them through that day, it, it, we could conceptualize a culinary tradition that you know, doesn't have any fermentation. But once you get into fermenting food today that you're going to eat next week, next month, um, um, or many months from now, you know, fermentation is, is really inevitable. Um, and, uh, you know, the way I got interested in fermentation was I moved from New York City to rural Tennessee 30 years ago, and I started keeping a garden. And I was such a naive city kid that it had never occurred to me that in a garden, all of the cabbage would be ready at about the same time, and all of the radishes would be ready at about the same time. And when I first, you know, encountered this, you know, kind of obvious reality of agricultural production, 
I decided I should learn how to make sauerkraut because I knew I loved sauerkraut and I knew that sauerkraut had something to do with preserving cabbage. And I looked in the joy of cooking and learned how to make sauerkraut. But it was really driven by this practical imperative that, you know, agricultural production is never, you know, the same amount every day. And so, you know, there's always periods of, of great abundance over abundance that are followed by periods of relative scarcity. And so, you know, fermentation has just been an incredibly important, um, um, you know, way for people to deal with this. Now, I mean, the range of fermented foods sometimes surprises people. Um, uh, you know, I think most people are aware that alcoholic beverages are uh, uh, produced by fermentation. And, you know, all the only way anyone's ever produced alcohol is by fermentation. You know, we have other methods uh, uh, through which we can concentrate it, distillation, but first you have to create it. And that always involves fermentation. It always involves yeasts. Um, so, um, um, but, but, you know, I have, I have some, some um, you know, different fermented foods here to ju just to talk about. Um, so a lot of people are not aware that coffee is fermented. So, you know, the, the fermentation of coffee, you know, doesn't happen in your kitchen or at the, you know, roaster where, where, you know, you might be buying your coffee, but it's happening at the harvesting end. You know, the, 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 the coffee bean that we're grinding doesn't grow on, on the bushes like this. It, it grows as, as a berry. So the, 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 the bean is surrounded by pulp. And generally the first step of processing is to just allow that um, sugary pulp to spontaneously ferment. But you know, in the course of that, the, you know, the biochemistry of the bean is altered. And um, you know, the, 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 the flavors that we are familiar with from coffee um, um, you know, a, a, a result in part from the fermentation as part of the processing. Very similarly, um, chocolate. Um, uh, cacao is also a fruit. And the cacao um, um, uh, uh, beans or seeds are, um, you know, encased in a sweet and very delicious fruit. Um, but you know, generally, the, the the pulp with the seeds is removed from the pods and allowed to spontaneously ferment. It breaks down the pulp, makes it much easier to separate any residue of the pulp from the beans for further processing. And like with the, with the coffee, it um, you know, alters the biochemistry of the beans and um, you know, develops the flavor that um, you know, so many of us uh, uh, love to eat. Um, you know, one fermented food, which is you know, really ubiquitous is vinegar. Um, so uh, 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 vinegar, the word comes from French vin aigre, so sour wine. And basically, you know, if you leave a bottle of wine uncorked, and particularly if you put it into a vessel with a wider surface area exposed to oxygen, then as I mentioned earlier, there are aerobic organisms um, that consume the alcohol and transform it into acetic acid, which is uh, which is vinegar, and, and um, you know vinegar is 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 ubiquitous. You know, whenever I meet people who hear what I do and they tell me, "Oh, I hate fermented foods," you know, they they might be thinking of you know some really strong flavored cheese, or maybe they're thinking about kimchi, or you know something that had a strong flavor that that put them off, and they're just imagining they don't like any fermented foods. But it would be very hard to you know. Um, um, uh, you know, in a restaurant uh, uh, without having any vinegar. Vinegar is just so, so, you know, a part of so many different things from, you know, salad dressings to uh, uh, condiments. And, uh, and, you know, in fact, almost all condiments are fermented. I mean, the old world condiments are directly fermented. So fish sauce, soy sauce, um, and all of our contemporary condiments, um, you know, ketchup, mayonnaise, mustard, um, uh, well, uh, uh, not always mayonnaise, but, uh, but you know, they, they rely on vinegar to um, uh, 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 stabilize them. Same with chutneys, same with salsas. But so vinegar is really um, um, ubiquitous. Um, let me talk a little bit about some of the practical benefits of, of, of fermentation. Um, um, so, you know, I talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, flavor. Fermentation creates strong flavors. Like some of the flavors are very strong. Not everybody loves every flavor of fermentation. 
Um, but people become very devoted to the flavors of fer fermentation that they come, come to like. And, you know, if you walk into a gourmet food store anywhere and you look around, most of what you're going to see are products of fermentation. Cheeses are fermented. I mean, there exist fresh cheeses that are not fermented, but, you know, virtually all cheeses are products of fermentation. And, um, uh, you know, the, the fermentation byproducts accumulate over time. The longer you ferment it, the stronger the flavor gets. You know, that's why you have a choice of mild cheddar cheese, medium cheddar cheese, or sharp or extra sharp cheddar cheese. They, they correlate to the time of fermentation. The longer you age the cheese and allow the bacteria that are part of it to um, you know, basically consume lactose and transform it into lactic acid, the sharper the flavor will get. Um, so, um, uh, you know, cheese, cheese is, is almost all fermented. Cured meats are almost all fermented. Um, olives are fermented. Pickles are fermented. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, chocolate and coffee and vanilla are, are, are fermented. Breads are all fermented. I mean, such a range of what you find in a gourmet food store and fermentation creates all of these strong flavors. Um, and, uh, and a lot of them are, are, are really um, unique flavors. Um, you know, there's nothing else quite like gorgonzola cheese. Um, you know, there's nothing else quite like soy sauce. There's nothing else quite like fish sauce. Like, you know, these strong flavors, not everybody loves them, but they're, you know, they're really specific. And the people who love them are very, very devoted to them. They're acquired tastes, uh, uh, I would say. You know, I don't think anyone is necessarily born loving them, but you know, we watch our parents, we watch our grandparents, we watch the adults around us, and that makes us that gives us a reason to try them and then try them again. Um, you know, a lot of these stronger fermented foods, you know, I didn't love as a child, but I have really, um, you know, learned to uh, 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 love them uh, uh, beyond flavor preservation. Um, you know, a lot, not all fermented foods are, are about preservation, um, but, but many of them are. The fermentation of vegetables generally is a practical strategy for, for preserving the vegetables. The fermentation of milk, yogurt, kefir, cheese, that's all about preservation. In fact, until, you know, widespread refrigeration in the 20th century, you know, fresh milk was, you know, not something that many people who were not directly involved in raising um, um, lactating mammals had access to. Because, you know, if there's no refrigerator where the animals are and there's no refrigerator, uh, um, um, you know, where it's being sold and there's no refrigerator in your home, the milk doesn't stay fresh. So, you know, we have a word in the English language that's become um, obsolete in just a century. It, it's clabber. Clabbered milk is simply milk that has been um, you know, left out at um, um, room temperature and the lactic acid bacteria uh, uh, that are indigenous to all milk um, um, consume lactose and produce acids and acidify the milk. And that's what clabbered milk is. And the, fir the first visible transformation is the milk thickens up a little bit as it continues to acidify eventually it will curdle from the acid. So the milk solids will float to the top above whey, this sort of yellowish um, uh, protein rich liquid. Um, um, and, um, you know, it's really curdling like that. That is the basis of um, um, a lot of cheese making. Uh, you separate out the, the, the watery part of the cheese, the whey, and then you concentrate this out, the, 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 the solids. Um, I mean, I think for a lot of people in, in the 21st century, it's almost impossible for us to sort of understand how important fermentation has been historically for food preservation. You know, um, uh, we have refrigerators and freezers, um, but I mean, understand that in you know, the year 2021, most households on planet Earth do not have a refrigerator. It's only in you know, the more affluent parts of the world that, you refriger that refrigeration is ubiquitous. And of course, you know, there's so much uncertainty about um, you know, energy in, into the future that, um, you know, it really, 
um, it behooves us to, um, uh, you know, not lose the wisdom of our ancestors and how they were able to effectively preserve food without refrigeration. So, you know, go back 100 years ago and, you know, none of us would have a refrigerator. Go back 200 years ago and, you know, there's no concept of canning. Canning was, a, was, was um, um, you know, patented in, the, in uh, maybe 1804, like just over 200 years ago um, in France, where they call canned foods, uh, uh, they, they call the process of canning apertization because they remember the name of Nicolas Apert, the clever Frenchman who, you know, developed the concept of sterilizing food in a jar. But take away refrigerators and freezers, take away preservative chemicals, take away um, um, uh, sterilizing food in a jar, and there aren't many other methods of food preservation. You can dry food in the sun if you live in a place that's um, uh, uh, sunny enough and dry enough to do that, um, you know, or you can ferment them. And, um, you know, most foods preserved by fermentation, you know, they're, they're not, they don't last forever the way, um, you know, tomatoes uh, 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 sealed in a can can last, you know, vir virtually forever. They're, you know, it's preservation for a period of time. With the fermentation of vegetables, it's, it's basically fermentation through the winter so that you can have some, um, you know, plant-based foods rich in vitamin C through the winter months when, you know, there's no fresh plant food available. Um, but, um, um, you know, our uh, expectations and notions of food preservation have, you know, really been formed by our recent history of freezers, refrigerators, canning, and preservative chemicals. But, you know, fermentation has been, you know, absolutely essential for food preservation historically. One of the reasons why people are getting interested in fermentation at the present time is health reasons. And let me uh, uh, address a little bit of the potential health benefits of, of fermented foods and, um, and some of the ways that fermentation transforms foods nutritionally. Now, it's very difficult to generalize. Not all fermented foods have the same nutritional qualities. You know, chocolate is not the same as sauerkraut and sauerkraut is not the same as salami and salami is not the same as cheddar cheese and cheddar cheese is not the same as bread so you know all these foods have different um, nutritional qualities but the process of fermentation transforms nutrients and foods in some very clear patterns and i would say that there are four broad ways in which um, uh, uh, the the nutrient content of food is transformed by fermentation Number one, I would call pre-digestion. Pre-digestion is the simple idea that while the food is fermented and you know the, the, the length of time that people ferment food ranges from a few hours for yogurt to you know a couple of years for miso or soy sauce. So and 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 and, and, and other things. Um, um, you know, cheeses can be aged for years. Uh, uh, certainly hams are sometimes aged for years. Um, you know, there are different things that have very long fermentations, but, um, um, you know, whatever the period of fermentation, nutrients are being digested and broken down into simpler forms by the fermentation organism. So, you know, I think that the most vivid example of this would be soybeans. You know, the reason why the vegetarian subcultures of the West um, adopted soybeans as almost a singular replacement for meat and milk is that soybeans are considered to be the plant food with the most concentrated protein. But the problem is that our human digestive systems are not really capable of extracting the protein from a soybean that has simply been cooked. Um, and so you really never see people eating you know, a bowl of soybeans for dinner the way they might with lentils or chickpeas or pinto beans or, or other beans. And you know, the, the, the Asian uh, uh, cultures that pioneered soy agriculture thousands of years ago recognized the indigestibility of the soybean and developed all of these different methods to make them more easily digestible. And, you know, many of them involve fermentation. So there's a lot of different styles of fermented uh, uh, soybeans. Um, here, this is, some, this is some miso that I made. Um, this is some soy sauce that I made. 
There's also tempeh, there's natto, there's actually many other variations of fermented soybeans. They involve, you know, they have different flavors, different fermentation organisms, different methods, different lengths of, of, of fermentation. But what they all have in common is that during the fermentation, the protein of the soybean gets broken down into amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. And this makes the nutrient of the soybean much more available. Uh, to our human bodies. Um, you know, similarly, the lactose in milk that so many people have a hard time digesting gets broken down by fermentation. And I meet people all the time who tell me they can't drink a glass of milk, but they can eat yogurt that's fermented from that same glass of milk because the fermentation breaks down the lactose. And the longer you ferment it, the less uh, residual, residual lactose there's going to be. And, you know, my little asterisk here is that, you know, most commercial yogurt that you can buy in a supermarket is fermented for the minimum time possible to set the milk, about two and a half hours. Um, you know, I generally ferment mine for 12 to 16 hours. It has a stronger, more assertive um, uh, sourness to it, but that's a result of more of the lactose being digested. So, you know, these are examples of pre-digestion. In fact, even the gluten in wheat and other grains that so many people have a hard time digesting um, gets broken down not by yeast, but by bacteria. And, um, you know, really, this is the difference between a packet of yeast this is like a, this is a pure culture that was isolated in a laboratory and propagated and it's available everywhere as, you know, a singular microorganism, which is something that does not exist in the natural world. Microorganisms are everywhere, but never singularly. This is a, you know, human technological innovation um, that only really became commercially available in the 20th century. This is a sourdough starter. I started with rye flour and water. The organisms that are in here came from the flour. Um, and uh, and it, involve, it, it includes yeast like this, but it also includes a range of bacteria, including lactic acid bacteria. And the lactic acid bacteria can digest gluten. So, you know, the longer you ferment your bread using a, a, a natural leavening, a, a traditional starter, you know, the less gluten you're going to have in the bread that you produce. And I meet people all the time who say that they thought they couldn't, in, they couldn't enjoy bread anymore because of their problems with gluten. But then when they learned how to, how to work with a sourdough, they were able to make bread that they were able to uh, uh, eat. So these are all examples of pre-digestion. The idea that nutrients are broken down to some degree before we eat them and become more bio uh, available to us as, as a result. Um, the second way that foods can be transformed by fermentation, um, I would call um, nutrient enhancement. And, and so that is that in, in addition to breaking down the nutrients that are in the food, the fermentation can um, generate additional nutrients. So, um, you know, these are really metabolic byproducts of the um, uh, of the organism. So, I mean, almost every fermented food or beverage has elevated levels of B vitamins as compared to the original food that you start with. Um, certain ferments, like I mentioned the Japanese soy ferment natto, um, this is one that has a, you know, kind of a, 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 a strong flavor because it, it's produced by bacteria that create alkaline rather than acid byproducts. And these alkaline byproducts, you know, kind of have a, have a whiff of ammonia. And that's challenging for some people who, you know, haven't really been able to enjoy foods like that. But, you know, many of us enjoy brie and camembert cheese, which also have, you know, similar flavor notes. And, um, but, but anyway, um, um, natto is, is considered to be the food richest in vitamin K2. Um, and natto and certain other ferments generate K vitamins, uh, which are not in the original food that, that you start with. Uh, and then there are these, um, uh, I call them um, um, uh, micronutrients that are, um, you know, metabolic byproducts that have been found to have some benefit to us. So for instance, in, you know, fermented vegetables here, this is a little bit of um, a, a somewhat traditional uh, uh, sauerkraut with um, uh, cabbage and carrots. 
This is a sauerkraut uh, uh, that is uh, uh, radishes. Um, but um, you know, you can make, you can ferment any kind of vegetables, but fermented vegetables have these compounds called isothiocyanates that are regarded as anti-carcinogenic that are generated during the fermentation. Natto that I just showed you a, a moment ago has these compounds that have gotten a lot of attention. And in fact, you can buy them in any vitamin supplement store in North America right now uh, called natto kinase. And it's a, uh, it's, it's a blood thinner um, and it also dissolves fibrin. So when you hear about people um, um, with you know, clogged arteries, arteriosclerosis, I mean, that's basically, you know, you have fibers building up in the blood vessels that are constricting circulation and this um, uh, a byproduct of natto fermentation has been found to, you know, break down the fibrin, these, these, these um, um, accumulations. So, you know, it has tremendous, uh, uh, you know, therapeutic um, um, potential. So, you know, there's lots of different um, byproducts like this that are really just being, um, you know, identified. Um, um, but, but there are a lot of them in different fermented foods. The third way besides um, breaking down nutrients that are there, enhancing the nutrients that are there, I would call detoxification. And, you know, it's basically the same thing as, as pre-digestion, except instead of digesting potentially nutritious compounds, it's breaking down potentially toxic compounds. So, um, you know, cassava uh, in the Amazon, where cassava is thought to have originated in, uh, in the Caribbean, in West Africa, Cassava grows with extremely high levels of cyanide compounds that can easily kill people if they were to try to eat unprocessed uh, uh, tubers. And so, you know, the processing is extremely simple. You peel them, you cut them into coarse chunks, put them in a bucket of water that initiates a fermentation. And within three to five days, the cyanide compounds are broken down into totally benign forms and it's safe to eat the um, uh, uh, cassava. Um, you know, not every toxin in food is quite as dramatic as cyanide. Um, uh, oxalic acid, you know, can create problems for some people. Um, oxalic acid breaks down un under fermentation. So, you know, this is just another important um, um, application of fermentation. Around the world, there's lots of foods like the nuts that I mentioned in Australia that, um, you know, can only be broken down um, um, or, uh, or can only be safely eaten after uh, uh, fermentation. Um, then the final uh, way that fermentation transforms foods nutritionally is the bacteria themselves. And, you know, not all fermented foods have living bacteria in them. You know, if you, um, you know, go to a bakery and buy a loaf of sourdough bread, or even if you make a loaf of sourdough bread at home, when you take that bread out of the hot oven, the bacteria that were part of the starter are no longer alive. So if you want to eat the dough raw, that's teeming with pro probiotic bacteria. But, you know, by the time the loaf is cooked, the bacteria um, have been killed by, by the high heat. So, you know, not every fermented food necessarily has um, um, uh, 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 live bacteria in them, but any fermented food that you can eat um, raw, or, I mean, it's, I mean it can, it's okay if the, origin, if the substrate was cooked in the first place, as long as it's not cooked after the fermentation, then it's got lots of, lots of bacteria in it. And, um, you know, basically, as, as we have been learning in recent decades, you know, bacteria are utterly essential to our functioning, um, to our physiology. Every, you know, healthy um, um, human being is host to, you know, something like a trillion microorganisms, just mind boggling numbers, um, you know, in great biodiversity. But, you know, that great biodiversity has been diminished. It's been diminished by chemical exposure from, you know, antibiotics to glycosate uh, um, to, um, you know, various uh, uh, preservative chemicals. I mean, lots of different chemicals, you know, including the chlorine in our water, which is put into water precisely to kill bacteria. But, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, chemical exposures that, that people in our um, uh, uh, time inevitably are exposed to have the effect of diminishing biodiversity in the gut. And, um, you know, live foods that 
are rich in biodiversity, um, you know, are a strategy to restore biodiversity in the gut. And of course, um, you know, the biodiversity in the gut affects not only digestion, but immune function, uh, brain function, um, you know, really almost every aspect of our um, um, functionality. And, um, you know, there's, there's growing evidence that, um, you know, um, um, probiotic strategies to increase biodiversity can have, you know, great uh, uh, benefits to us from improved digestion to improved immune function to improved uh, 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 brain function and, um, um, you know, less depression, better moods. Um, so, um, you know, some, some, uh, the concept of probiotics is actually quite, um, uh, controversial. Um, you know, the people who are, you know, manufacturing capsules would say, well, you know, I mean, sure there might be great biodiversity in fermented foods, but, you know, have, have, have those strains really been evaluated and been shown to have benefit, you know, our strains have been studied. Well, you know, most of the probiotic capsules are proprietary strains, you know, nobody's really investing money to in clinical trials of sauerkraut because nobody owns sauerkraut. Um, um, most of the things that people are putting money into um, uh, controlled trials to demonstrate their efficacy are, are these, um, you know, patented strains and most probiotic capsules are, you know, they might, they might say on the package that, you know, every capsule has, you know, 5 billion cells, but it's 5 billion copies of a single cell or maybe two or three. Whereas, you know, every um, um, traditional fermented food is really a manifestation of biodiversity. Let me talk a little bit about um, um, the practical aspect of fermentation and, and, and you know, how, you know, how the f organisms of fermentation get to the food. So the title of my first book about fermentation is wild fermentation. And this is not a phrase that I made up. This is a phrase that's found throughout the literature and it means something specific. Wild fermentation is fermentation based on organisms that are present on the food. Um, you know, let's take the example of sauerkraut. Um, you know, nobody ever add, well, I, I shouldn't say nobody ever, but generally people do not add a starter to sauerkraut. All the bacteria you need is on the cabbage, or for that matter, the carrot, the turnip, the tomato, the okra, the string bean, you know, all vegetables. Actually, all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth are host to lactic acid bacteria, not generally as the dominant strain, but once you create the environment for fermenting vegetables, meaning submerged under liquid, generally, although not always with a little bit of salt, um, lactic acid bacteria become dominant in that particular environment. And um, uh, I mean, people nowadays, you could buy a little powdered starter of lactobacillus plantarum. Um, um, you know, some, some people like to use that. Um, you know, health authorities in some parts of the world are requiring that even though there's no tradition of that. And, you know, there's no danger with sauerkraut. There's no case history of, of, of problems. But it's interesting that um, you know um, almost 80 years ago, the U.S. sauerkraut industry rejected the idea of using a, a pure culture starter of Lactobacillus plantarum, which is the 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 late stage dominant bacteria in in sauerkraut. And you know their reason was that it it produced an inferior product. Their their taste testing you know, yielded the information that it wasn't as delicious. And it turns out that, you know, ferment, that, that the fermentation of sauerkraut in particular is actually a successional process. And it's generally initiated by uh, uh, this um, lactic acid bacteria that is universally found on plants growing out of soil. That's Leuconostoc uh, uh, miserantoides. Um, and, um, you know, and then as the environment becomes more acidic, it gives rise to other strains of lactic acid bacteria. And it's a little bit like the succession of a forest where, you know, each tree that becomes dominant in a forest changes the light and soil conditions 
and, and sort of sets the stage for what the next organism that's going to be dominant in that forest is. And the same thing happens in a, in a jar of sauerkraut. But in terms of the, the flavor of the sauerkraut at the end, part of the flavor complexity is the accumulation of flavor of, 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 of different fermentation byproducts from these different strains. And if you go directly to the end stage bacteria, Lactobacillus plantarum, which is typically, you know, what's found in the, you know, little white powders that people market as sauerkraut starter, um, you know, you, 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 you miss out on the accumulation of the earlier stages of fermentation and it results in um, uh, less complex flavor. Um, so, okay, pure culture starters, that would be like the little packet of Lactobacillus plantarum, that would be like a little packet of yeast. I mean, it's not that I think it's bad to, to use these. I mean, starters like this can enable us to make things that, you know, would not necessarily be possible in our environment. So, for instance, I make tempeh. And, um, you know, I buy a little powdered starter, Rhizopus oligosporus, and, you know, I, I soak soybeans, I cook the soybeans, I sprinkle a little bit of the starter on them, um, you know, keep them in a warm environment between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours, and they sort of grow into um, um, a, a piece of tempeh as this fungus uh, uh, binds them, them together. So, I mean, I don't think anything is wrong with using starter cultures, but it's just important for people to understand that they are a departure from the history of fermentation. They only became possible and they only became commercially available over the course of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, they just were never part of, um, you know, any kind of um, uh, uh, traditional fermentations. Now, um, like uh, uh, more traditional kinds of starters other than wild fermentation would be when you take a little bit of a previous batch of, of your um, uh, uh, fermented food and use that to start the next one. So like my yogurt, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I started with this yogurt starter um, uh, that actually was a, an old world, what I would call an heirloom yogurt starter that had its roots in Romania. It was in a restaurant in New York for 120 years. Um, a student of mine who lived in the UK read about it in, my, in, in wild fermentation, went to that restaurant, brought some of it back to the UK. I taught with her in the UK. She gave me some of that starter. I brought it back. So it's a very well-traveled starter, but I've been perpetuating it for like 10 years, but I never eat all of it. I have a little jar in my, my, my fridge that's yogurt starter and, I, and it's hidden in the back and it says, do not eat. Um, and I never want to use all my yogurt starter. I want to save some to put in the next batch. In the literature of fermentation, there's a beautiful expression for this. When you take the last batch to start the next batch, it's called back slopping. Um, so, um, um, you know, I've been back slopping my yogurt for four years now. And, you know, we can trace the, the origin of this, you know, back to 19th century Romania. Um, you know, this one, my sourdough starter doesn't have quite as a, a, a long of a history. I started it, as I said earlier, from rye flour and water about 25 years ago, but I've been perpetuating it for 25 years. And every time I make uh, uh, some bread or uh, um, some pancakes, or sometimes I make this uh, Russian beverage using sourdough starter called kvass, but every time I use it, I save a little bit of it and feed it more flour and water. And so I'm back slopping with the, with the, 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 the sourdough uh, uh, starter. And, and, you know, almost anything can be made with back slopping. I have a, a, a friend who runs a brewery in North Carolina and um, he has one, one of his uh, uh, fermentation tanks, he never empties. He always leaves a couple of gallons of the previous batch of beer. And then when he puts the, the fresh wort in, the previous batch is the starter for the next batch. I've met people who are salami makers who always add a little bit of the previous batch of salami into the new batch of salami that they're making. Uh, um, you know, a lot of traditional cheese making, they use the same um, um, bucket for milking and don't wash it. So it becomes a vehicle of perpetuation of sort of back slopping from the previous batch into the next batch. So, so back slopping is, is, is one concept of a starter. Um, you know, then there are SCOBYs, symbiotic communities of bacteria and yeast. And what characterizes these is that they, they um, create a, um, like a physical form that we can see. So this is kombucha, and you can see floating on the top 
is the little rubbery pancake like layer um, that is the SCOBY. And the SCOBY um, is the host to um, a community of organisms that spin this rubbery skin that they share and they coordinate their reproduction. And when you put it on some sweet tea, those organisms grow into the tea, they digest the sugar, they create acids and a little bit of alcohol, um, and the mother grows. It gets thicker with every layer. So everyone who makes kombucha for any period of time wants to give away mothers. You can peel away layers and share them with, with other people. Um, so these are scobies. Another example of a scoby would be kefir. The, 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 the milk culture, and that um, has a very different appearance than the, than the kombucha mother. It looks like little uh, florets of cauliflower, lots of surface area and very biodiverse. More than 30 distinct organisms have been identified um, um, in, in kefir grains. Um, so there's wild fermentation, there's all these different kinds of starters, but you know when you think about the starters, like they all had to have started with a wild fermentation. Um, you know, another way that, that people sometimes introduce organisms into fermentation system is through some botanical ingredient. So, um, um, you know, koji, which is, um, um, you know, rice with a particular fungus Aspergillus oryzae growing on it, which is the starter for making sake and other rice-based alcohols throughout Asia for making uh, 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 miso, uh, soy sauce. Um, and, um, um, you know, there's a lot of interest around the world in koji right now. And now, you know, now you can buy um, um, a, a pure culture starter. I didn't take it out of the fridge to, to show you, um, but it's just, a, it's just a little powder. But, um, um, you know, there's all kinds of amazing you know, ethnobotanical accounts of, combinations of plants that people would use to mix into cakes of rice or millet or amaranth or other grains where the botanical ingredients that they've collected are the source of the spores of this fungus that, that, that they're growing. Um, okay, now let me just like, you know, bring this all back to the soil. Um, you know, why do why is fermentation everywhere? Why do all plants have lactic acid bacteria? Um, you know, the, where these organisms are coming from primarily is the soil. And as you know, anyone who's you know studying soil is you know understands that you know soil organisms have these complex interactions with plants, and they you know, enable many plants to access nutrients, the, you know, fungal network in the soil, um, you know, enables uh, 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 certain kinds of, uh, um, you know, exchanges of um, uh, uh, nutrients, of um, information, chemical signaling, um, you know, um, um, among plants. They, they create this, this, this network, but they're also essential for, um, you know, for plants to access nutrients in the soil. But as plants grow from seeds out of the soil, they are carrying, um, you know, microorganisms that came from the soil with them. Um, and so, you know, just as, you know, a baby who is born is carrying um, uh, uh, bacteria that they've ex been exposed to in the course of childbirth from their mother, so too every seed that's growing out of the soil, you know, gets its, you know, original um, um, uh, uh, microbial populations from the soil that it's growing out of. Um, and then, you know, then there are other sources. I mean, you know, the insects that land on the plants are moving organisms from plant to plant and, and sometimes spreading other kinds of organisms that didn't necessarily have their source in the soil, but the soil is the original source of, you know, most of the organisms of, uh, of, of fermentation. Um, so, you know, all of, all of these things really, um, you know, they, 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 they tie together. Um, you know, sometimes people wonder whether, um, you know, they have to buy organic produce in order to ferment. And um, 
uh, you know, I mean, I always tell people that, you know, there's, there, there's all kinds of reasons um, um, that you should be supporting organic agriculture rather than chemical agriculture, but the fermentation seems to happen anyway. Um, um, so, um, you know, I have done hundreds of demonstrations of sauerkraut making with whatever cabbage people handed me and it's never not worked. Um, you know, even when it's a cellophane wrapped cabbage from, uh, you know, from a giant supermarket chain, um, you know, the, the, the fermentation seems to be able to um, persist. Anyway, I can go on and talk about fermentation um, almost forever, but it's more interesting for me and probably more interesting for you if, um, uh, if it's a little bit more interactive. So I wonder whether, um, whether anyone has any questions that I could address. They're starting to come in. They're starting to come in. Okay. Your, your, your passion is, uh, is, <laughs> is, is clear and your depth of knowledge, of course, you're, you're famous for it. Um, so uh, we've got a, a couple of questions here and then Faith has got a few which are um, maybe pushing the envelope. Um, so I'll just do a couple of the simple ones first and then we can get into some heavier ones. Uh, Bill asks, uh, what temperatures are okay to store sauerkraut or kimchi? at the point it tastes good to me, how long do you find it keeps at 50 or 60 or 70? We refrigerate ours at 37, but when you make more, would like to store some elsewhere. Um, okay, well, I mean, it's all temperature dependent. So, um, uh, I mean, certainly in a, a full jar of sauerkraut, you know, something acidic and salty in a refrigerator. I mean, I, I don't want to say anything will ever last forever, but, you know, I mean, if you find it years later uh, uh, and the jar is mostly full, it's going to be totally fine. The only problem if, you know, if the jar is half empty, you know, like this, the problem you might encounter is that little bit of, um, you know, oxygen in that air can feed aerobic organisms and so you probably would end up with a little funky layer on the top some little um uh, a white layer that's called calm yeast or potentially a hairy white mold you know these things are generally harmless i mean you can just scrape them off the long if the mold grows the longer it grows it'll start to uh degrade the flavor and the texture of it so i mean anything will last longer in a full vessel than in a half empty vessel with um um, um oxygen uh, uh access now in terms of warmer temperatures if you you know if you have a cellar that really stays 55 degrees um I mean, these things will also last for years. I mean, I, I was visit. I, I have a root cellar under my house in Tennessee that, you know, like this time of year when our, you know, days are typically in the late 80s or in the high 80s or, or low 90s, you know, my root cellar ends up in the 70s. And over the course of a few weeks, the sauerkraut will get soft and mushy and unappealing. It's not getting toxic or dangerous. It's just like a you know, an aesthetic aversion for me. So, you know, I don't like to keep it in the summer in the cellar, but all winter, I mean, I make my big batch of sauerkraut, like this radish kraut that I showed you, I have a, a like a 55 gallon vessel that I, that I fill with radishes from my friend's biodynamic farm. And, um, you know, it's great from, you know, November through May, you know, my cellar really stays 55 degrees and it's great. I was in Vermont a few years ago doing a workshop at Flack Family Farms in yeah. Northern Vermont and Doug Flack disappeared into his um, uh, cellar. And by, by the way, their farm, you know, has a value added business of producing sauerkraut and other fermented vegetables from produce that they grow. And yeah. Doug disappeared into his cellar and brought me up some three-year-old kimchi that had been in his root cellar for three years. And I would not have been able to distinguish that from a batch of delicious kimchi that had fermented for a month or, or three months. So, you know, if you can really keep it earth temperature 55 degrees, it'll be stable indefinitely. You know, as you get, you know, gradations above that, then you'll, I mean, the problem you run into is that there are enzymes in vegetables that break down pectins, which are make what make vegetables, um, crispy and, and um, uh, crunchy. And so as you get higher temperatures, um, um, even in the presence of salt, which, which marginally inhibits these enzymes, um, um, you know, they'll become more active and, and over time, they'll make your vegetables soft, though not dangerous. Um, one salvage protocol I've seen people use is dehydrating them. You know, if you dehydrate soft vegetables, they get crispy again in a different way. Beautiful, beautiful. 
uh, yeah, root cellar is my experience. As long as root cellar stays cool, um, you can it'll they stay they stay quite well. Um, but then, you but know, let me just say one thing. I mean, you can make sauerkraut at any temperature. Like you know, people in the tropics can make sauerkraut. I mean, right. it's not going to last for months, but they don't need it to last for months because in the tropics you don't have a long period of the year where there's no fresh food. So, you know, it's very, I mean, it's very elegant that like in cold places where you need it, it's easy to preserve. Yeah. In warm places where you don't need it, it's more of a challenge. Yeah. I think, I mean, for me, you said that if, when it gets mushy, it's unappealing. And I think that's the temperature in my experience. If it, you know, if you let it ferment for too long, it'll go from fermented and good to, to mushy and then keep it in the root cellar for three months, doesn't matter. It's always gonna be mushy. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. And particularly for cucumbers and other hot weather vegetables. Um, yeah. So, you know, cabbages, generally people are harvesting, you know, at the end of the summer when yeah, it's, okay. you know, once it's cooling down, cucumbers are ready in the heat of the summer. And so that alone just makes them more challenging to ferment. Plus they have more of these pectinase enzymes. So they'll just get mushy faster, no matter what, um, you know, take off the blossom end. That's where you have the best, the, the biggest concentration uh, uh, of them. And I mean, here in Tennessee, I just ferment them for like four or five days. And then I put them in the fridge and let them ferment another week or two in the fridge. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, Steven has a small question here. Is that a sprouting bag, a nut milk bag or something else hanging behind you? Just curious. It's a linen bread bag. I don't like to put bread in plastic. Nice, nice. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go into some of these longer questions from Faith um, that have to do with microbiology. And um, uh, thank you, Sander, great presentation. I'm wondering if you can speak to or direct me to knowledge around how the endophytic microbes of a plant, those are the ones that live inside the plant, not on the surface. Um, fruit, vegetables, herbs, impact nutritional qualities of produce post-harvest. My assumption is that post-harvest, it's the endophytic microbes of a plant that break down the complex molecules, um, i.e. polyphenols, vitamins, proteins, et cetera. Those compounds that um, help qualify a food as nutrient dense versus strictly environmental conditions. There's enzymes there. And then second piece of this, um, I think it's a, it says continued, uh, plants that are of high nutritional quality are anecdotally seen to have a longer shelf life, but they would logically have more indigenous microbes. Those microbes will need to eat to survive post-harvest. Are these organisms naturally more efficient metabolically, or are they different species in the organisms found in the same plant variety grown differently, which has poor shelf life? Okay, I, have to say that I just have to say okay. Faith knows a lot more than I do, just, <laughs> yes. to, be to, just to be able to pose that question. So I, yeah. I mean, yeah. really, yeah. I, I mean, I have to say, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't even really fully understand the, the question, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I mean, so I guess I, I can try to break it down and offer some of the things that I understand and see if there's a, a, a back and forth here. You know, the, the sort of there's, there is a, an experience a lot of people have that when plants have a higher bricks reading, better flavor, et cetera, they have a longer shelf life. That a tomato doesn't rot after a week or after three days, it'll you know, take two weeks, it'll desiccate. You know, some oranges will rot, some oranges will desiccate. Um, my understanding is that that longer shelf life had more to do with the biochemical complexity of the plant and some of those compounds being unable to be digested by microbes. And so they were um, the plant the, the lasted longer because it became more indigestible. You said, you know, dehydrating is an example. Um, so, well, yeah. I, I mean, I would just say that there's no compound that cannot be digested by microbes. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, it's like, what is the microorganism that can digest it right there at that time? Um, you know, does something have to happen to it for the microbes to be able to access the, the, the nutrients? I mean, um, but you know, there, 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 there are no compounds, you know, that, that, um, you know, that, that plants produce or the humans have figured out how to produce that microbes can't break down. I mean, you know, and when we have oil, well, that's granted, oil but I'll just give you, yeah. I'll give you an experience. I had a couple of years ago on my farm where I had, um, put two bushel baskets together and stuck them in the picking shed and pulled them apart a month later. And there was a bunch of collards in there in between the two bushel baskets that had desiccated and not rotted. And I was like, huh, you would think a 
you know, a bunch of collards in between two bushel baskets, like would rot, but it, it, it dried out instead. And so I think we do have examples of crops that have those higher nutrient levels doing that over time, desiccating and not decomposing. But yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I, I would think that that would have to do with, um, you know, environmental conditions just that enabled it to dry, dry faster than the- you've seen, you've seen two oranges on a counter and one of them turns into a hard brown ball and one of them turns into green pulp, right? I mean, you've had that experience. So like they both sat in similar environmental conditions and one rotted and one desiccated. Yeah, but they might not have been grown. They probably weren't grown in the same environmental conditions. Right. Like, you know, my biodynamic farmer friend would tell me that like, you know, his soil, you know, that he's that he's been, you know, adding the biodynamic preps to for decades, you know, just produces things with stronger skins that 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 are much more stable and last much longer because of, you know, the silica that he's been um, 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 adding. And, you know, I mean, there's so many factors. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not just the microorganisms on the food or in the environment. It's also the, you know, the the structure of the food itself that of course has so much to do with soil conditions, um, but also um, environmental conditions while the plant is grown. Yeah. No, I mean, I just, yeah. <laughs> Good um, questions. Um, you know, let me, let me point per people to uh, some interesting research, uh, but there, there is a microbiologist at uh, Tufts University uh, 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 the Benjamin Wolf Lab, and and uh, uh, Ben Wolf and his uh, uh, collaborators have been, um, uh, um, you know, collecting soil samples from farms, collecting plant samples from the same farms, and making sauerkraut out of the plants from those farms, and trying to, you know, trying to really see, you know, to what degree is biodiversity in the soil manifesting as biodiversity on the plants and to what degree is this resulting in different qualities in the fermented vegetable at the end. And they've also been investigating a lot of other, you know, questions relating to the microbial communities of, of fermented foods. But, you know, they're trying to look at how does that relate to um, biodiversity of the soil. Brilliant. I'll, that's right down the street here. I'd love to <laughs> follow up with them and see what the corollaries are between the microbial communities and the biochemical compounds as they as they flow through. That's very, very interesting. There's so much to learn, right? I mean, that's well, not that and, we understand. And the anything, thing is, it's such a so area much. of inquiry because, you know, as, as, you know, as you know, as the Bionutrient Food Association, I mean, you know, until you know, really until the, the new millennium, you know, science really didn't have methodologies to look at complex communities of microorganisms. And so, you know, we're just developing those micro, the, the, those methodologies now. We thought soil fungi were a bad thing. Yeah. Right. Sun, well, fungi are bad. Like fungicides, like fungicide is good. But <laughs> Except for the fact that plants evolved in symbiotic relationships with fungi for a very long period of time. So, <laughs> um, all right. Um, Lenore asks, uh, can you speak to re many doctors' controversial fears for candida patients with chronic yeast infections to avoid fermented foods? What makes apple cider vinegar compared to many other vinegars more therapeutic as an antiviral, antifungal, probiotic, et cetera? Okay, well, I, I mean, I'm not sure that I can speak to, you know, what makes apple cider vinegar different from, from other vinegars, except that, you know, what white vinegar is, um, you know, is this very strange industrial process that's very different from traditional vinegars, you know, um, you know, apple cider vinegar, malt vinegar, wine vinegar, you know, you basically start with um, um, you know, a, a fermentation, you create alcohol, and then from that alcohol, you, you leave it exposed to um, um, oxygen, and this second fermentation process takes place, turning it into um, um, acetic acid. But I can speak to the broader question of candida and, and fermented foods. So, you know, what feeds candida are sugars. It happens that sugars are the basis of many fermented foods, including alcoholic beverages and vinegar and kombucha. 
So, um, you know, let's let's take the example of kombucha. Like, you know, kombucha. Some of the sugar is um, um, is is uh, metabolized into acids, but some of the sugar remains. If all of the sugar was converted into acids, it would taste like vinegar. And indeed, if you leave your kombucha to ferment for a month, it'll turn into vinegar. And most people won't want to drink it, and they certainly won't be able to drink a big glass of it. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, it begins as, you know, all sugar and barely any uh, 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 acid. You always add a, add a little bit of mature kombucha to acidify the environment, but it begins as a high sugar, low acid. If you let it go on, you'll end up with no sugar, very high acid, but where people like to drink it is somewhere in the middle there when you know some of the sugar has been converted into acid and the acid you know, people experience the acid as like an accent flavor to something that's still sweet. So, you know, if you drink kombucha and you have um, uh, candida problems, you know, you're drinking something that still has residual sugar that can potentially feed your, um, uh, uh, your, your yeast infection. Um, you know, if you drink an alcoholic beverage like that, generally is going to still have some residual sugar that can you know, feed your candida. On the other hand, I have heard, you know, so many people who've incorporated, um, you know, sauerkraut or yogurt or, yeah. um, you know, types of ferments that are not starting with sugar, where you have, you know, other kinds of carbohydrates that are, that, 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 that are fermenting. And a lot of people, um, uh, you know, report great success by incorporating fermented foods as um, part of a candida diet. I mean, what I have come to believe is that the general medical advice to avoid all fermented foods is really the advice of people who can't be bothered to distinguish between different types of fermented foods. Um, right. But, you know, also, I am not a medical pr practitioner. I try not to... Um, caveat, you know, caveat, caveat. Advice. Yes. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me i'll, I'll say yeah um <laughs> all right um uh gm a simple question what's the restaurant in new york where the sourdough culture is from mm, it's a it's the yogurt culture yogurt. uh it's a it, it's this old conishery on houston street called um yona shimmel Okay. So, you know, it's a real like old world place that's just okay. still this little hole in the wall and they mostly make knishes and they have yogurt. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know what a knish is, but <laughs> it's a little potato, a little potato cake. Okay, cool. I was going to think it was a, it was a, 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 a um, flour based thing. All right. Um, uh, Juan Carlos asks, uh, have you used fermentation to help your plants like like weed teas and things like that? Well, sure. I mean, I would argue that, you know, every compost pile is an example of fermentation. Now it's not, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, ideally it's not anaerobic uh, uh, um, um, uh, metabolism. Um, but, you know, if we're going to take a broad definition of fermentation as the transformative action of microorganisms, well, you know, that's what's taking the, you know, transforming the pile of, you know, plant scraps and kitchen scraps and manure and whatever else you might be putting on your compost pile and, you know, breaking it down into humus. So, I mean, I would say that, you know, fermentation is the basis of of, of soil fertility, you know, even if it's just in the forest, it's, you know, the, you know, the leaf litter breaking down under the activity of fungus and, and bacteria that's, you know, creating soil, renewing the soil, creating fertility for, um, uh, 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 for more plants. But sure, I mean, I've, I've played around with lots of different compost teas. Uh, you know, I, I, I built a little uh, um, um, uh, aerobic brewer, you know, following the, the way that um, um, Elaine uh, uh, Ingham uh, uh, recommends doing it. I've done lots of more informal things. I mean, in my travels in Latin America, I've seen, you know, just an incredible amount of, um, um, you know, um, um, uh, 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 barrels, you know, filled with, um, you know, different kinds of, you know, plant material, seaweed, um, you, you know, leaf litter, 
whatever, you know, there's a lot of specific methodologies I've encountered, the Korean natural farming, where they take some rice and put it in a box under leaf litter and encourage those organisms to grow onto the rice and then use that as a starter. The Japanese method called Bokashi, where, you know, people use a, a formulation called uh, uh, EM, effective microorganisms. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different methodologies and like everything related to farming and gardening, you know, people, people can have very different approaches and still have great success. But I think, you know, what unites all of these different approaches is, you know, it's the microbial breakdown of varied organic materials feeds soil fertility really more than anything by building biodiversity. Yeah. No, no, the foundation of microbial sophistication and complexity and vitality, I think, is where success comes from, you know, broadly. Um, the nuances are maybe impossible to track down and probably are unnecessary to track down. But yeah, yeah, absolutely beautiful. Um, and let me, let me say one other thing, like, you know, fermentation in, in, in agriculture is not limited to that. I mean, you know, uh, um, well, uh, certain kinds of seeds you need to you need to ferment before they become fertile, like you know tomato seeds. Um, yeah. Um, you know, lots of plants, but be, besides for culinary use, fiber use. Um, you know, there's this word called redding, which comes from the D Dutch word for rotting. And basically, you know, if you were to want to make you know fibers out of um, you know hemp or um, um, amaranth or other you know big stocky plants, you know you just soak them in water, and fermentation will break down all that connective tissue and liberate the the, the fibers. So I mean, there's so many applications of of fermentation beyond foods and beverages. Yeah. No, it's a. I, I, when I teach my courses, I call it principles of biological systems. And I always say, look, it's the bottom of the food chain is, you know, what we're trying to facilitate being flourishing to the greatest degree possible. And it real, the only question is, you know, what's going on in your ecosystem that's limiting that, inhibiting that from happening? Because everywhere is unique. And it's once we understand that the, <laughs> the microbes are in charge, um, and when they're happy, <laughs> only then do we, do we flourish. Then it's all of a sudden it, it's it's a different different angle on the whole on the whole process. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Matt has a question here. As a craft cider maker, I'm aware how taste can potentially be unique to the cider maker, even when compared to another cider maker using the same variety of apples. This could be influenced by geographic area, soil, or processes. But I have often thought it could be influenced by our own personal microbiome too. Do you have any experience or thoughts around this? Uh, sure, sure. I mean, you know, I don't want to discount any of it. You know, I would say that like, you know, the unique microbiome of the farm where the tree I, 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 is, is have more influence than, you know, your unique microbiome. But, you know, I don't want to discount the possibility that like the person whose hands are are, are, are touching the apples could contribute something um, um, unique to it. I mean, I've certainly met bakers who feel like it's it's critically important to mix with your hands and not with a spoon, yeah. um, um, because there is so much sort of you know personal microbial influence on it. But you know, personally, I believe that you know the influence of the you know unique communities of organisms that manifests in the soil in different places is going to be more influential than yeah. what's on your hands. You can use the same variety and grow it in different and, you know, have a different microbiome in the soil and that's going to have a major impact on even the compounds in the apples to begin with. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you say, in the nutrient density and the, in the bricks readings, yeah. um, in so many different things about the apple. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, uh, Mandy asks, uh, or says, Sandra, I loved your uh, Fermentation as Metaphor book. How has the book been received? Do you imagine doing more work to promote those ideas, changing hearts and minds? Well, okay, first, okay, so let me, let me show off that book. This is the book that just came out um, um, in pandemic times, uh, uh, Fermentation as Metaphor. Um, and it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a meandering, um, you know, exploration of, you know, starting with like, you know, how in the English language we use the word fermentation to describe any kind of bubbly, excited phenomenon, um, you know, and then, and then just, um, 
you know, kind of exploring other, other, you know, related uh, uh, aspects. And, you know, frankly, the book has not sold nearly as well as my more practical oriented books. Um, But, you know, I I feel very, um, you know, committed to expanding the context for talking about fermentation. And, you know, in in each of my books, I I have, you know, tried to do that. And um, I continue to try to do that when I, um, um, you know, talk to people in different kinds of venues about fermentation. Let me just show my other books too. Um, the Art of Fermentation. Um, this is my biggest book um, that has the most uh, uh, thorough information about fermentation. It's not exactly recipes, but it's very how to ferment uh, 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 many different kinds of foods oriented. And then my other book is the revolution will not be microwaved inside America's underground food movements. And um, I wrote this book after my after Wild Fermentation came out in 2003, and I did this cross country book tour. I mean, I just met you know so many people doing interesting grassroots food activism from you know urban gardeners to seed savers to dumpster divers to you know people in different nutritional movements and the raw milk underground that I, I just was inspired to write a book about grassroots food activism. And this is a book about, you know, just different kinds of activist movements. And, um, you know, this week I am sort of finishing, uh, 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 reviewing my page proofs for my next book that'll be out in October, which is called Fermentation Journeys. That's, um, you know, about, um, you know, different kinds of new fermented foods and beverages that I've learned about um, in my, in my uh, uh, travels, which have been, uh, uh, fairly extensive, and um, you know, there's so much interest in fermentation. I've actually, I've, I've taught in like maybe two dozen countries, and and gotten to, um, you know, uh, uh, explore fermentation traditions in a lot of different places, and that's what my new book is about. Wonderful, and you know, for those who don't know about your role in the broader ecosystem, you are the <laughs> the go-to guy on fermentation, and it's great that you've got these books and the culture, and anybody who's interested in tapping into that culture and community, you know, I really would direct them to you first. I know lots of other people are in on it, but um, yeah, thank you for your work um, bringing this forth, you know, bringing it back or or <laughs> back to at least of the uh, Western, the English speaking um, culture. It seems like you've been, you've been pretty, pretty seminal on that. Um, so thank you. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill, just as a response to Juan Carlos, so you may be familiar with Michael Phillips, who writes of fermented herbal teas for plants. Um, and that was what I was referring to. I think, you know, Michael Phillips has some great, great work, practical guidance there for people who want to understand. Um, I think it was, um, Michael Weisel Planet is referred to here. I think he's got it in some of the other books also, those recipes. Um, Greg asks, is it possible to make alcoholic kombucha at five to 7% ABV without pasteurizing it and adding some wine yeast? What natural strains of yeast produce high ABV about five percent? Well, I mean, I know that there are people producing um, alcoholic kombucha, and I think the way that they're doing it is they start the way the way mine and the typical uh, uh, setup with uh, with a, a kombucha mother and open to oxygen like this, um, and then at some point they move it into an airlocked vessel like this, so that only so that that selects for which organisms can grow. The organisms that um, require oxygen can no longer grow once you have it in a in an airlocked vessel. But the organisms that don't require oxygen, the yeast, can continue to grow. So I don't think that you necessarily need to, you know, introduce a, a specific strain of yeast, like the yeast, the yeast that's, that, that is in here, I mean, has the potential to produce um, um, more alcohol. The reason why it doesn't like this is that as fast as the yeast are, are, are metabolizing sugars into alcohol, the acetic acid bacteria are consuming the alcohol and transforming transforming it into acetic acid, but they can only do that in the presence of oxygen. So, you know, if you 
um, um, transfer, if you, if you let it get started for a couple of days uh, in an open vessel and then transfer it to um, uh, an airlocked vessel, then you know, that will enable the yeast that's part of the kombucha to continue, but the uh, acetic acid bacteria that consume the alcohol cannot because they don't have oxygen. Beautiful. Um, you know, I mean, there's not only one way to do it. I mean, you know, it, certainly in the world of com commercial kombucha, people are doing all kinds of different things. So it's entirely possible that there are people who are doing a process uh, uh, like he describes of, you know, pasteurizing it or using some chemical means to stop the initial fermentation and then introducing, you know, some kind of selected yeast strain. So there's I a lot think of you're looking for an, an alternate method, just as you did explained about how yeah. to you know, get the, get the airlock on it. Beautiful. All right, we've only got about five minutes left. Um, uh, Elul asks, uh, what is your basic definition of fermentation? I know you opened with it, but maybe after- Yeah, this sure. So, I mean, my the lay definition that I would typically work with is fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, you know, uh, that that's very different from the biologist definition. Um, but yeah, that 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 that's generally that's generally how how I would define it. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> Faith asks: Are the fermentation organisms the same organisms that decompose a plant? Are we selected for them, or are they metabolically flexible and can do many types of digestive jobs? Well, I would say in general, the fermentation organisms are not the organisms that would decompose a, a plant because, you know, let, let's take the case of sauerkraut, you know, the, the lactic acid bacteria that produce the acids are precisely what's enabling the plant material to be preserved. Um, um, you know, other organisms would decompose it uh, 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 much faster. Let's say let's say you just shredded a, a cabbage and just left the loosely shredded cabbage in a bowl. Yeah. Um, you, you know, the way many of us, you know, have, have had half of a cabbage and in the fridge or out of the fridge. And after a couple of days, you notice there's a, a little film of, of mold that grows on those cut surfaces, aerobic organisms. Uh, um, um, accessing nutrients oozing out of the, the, the cut plant tissue, um, uh, you know, a little, a little uh, uh, generally dark colored mold will develop on that. Well, if you just shredded a whole cabbage and left it in a warm, humid place, you know, it would just become engulfed in this cloud of mold. And after, you know, after a few days in a warm, humid environment, that cloud of mold would just decompose the, the cabbage into a little puddle of slime. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's generally different organisms or in many cases, not organisms, but enzymes that are, um, you know, that, that are in the vegetables uh, uh, from the beginning that are, that, are, that, are, that are decomposing them. And generally the organisms that we select for fermentation would be inhibiting um, um, you know, the, these various processes of decomposition, whether they're microbial or enzymatic. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, uh, Valerie asks, what's the name of the lab that is doing the research re, um, impacts on biodiversity and soil and fermentation? The one at the top. Um, it's the Wolf Lab, the, 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 the Benjamin Wolf Lab, Wolf with an E, um, um, if people can, ask, can access the, the, the chat here, there, there is, um, uh, uh, there's a link to it, um, uh, but it's uh, it's at Tufts and it's called the Wolf Lab with an E on the end of Wolf. Great. Um, all right. Um, let me see if I can. Susan asks: Is it is it important to try to be able to consume different um, kimchi batches that have been made by different people? Well, I mean, I would say that um, uh, I, you know. Because, because probiotics is about biodiversity, yeah. I would say eating different batches with different vegetables is a great way to get more biodiversity because, you know, different vegetables, different farms, you know, different ve vegetables grown on different farms are going to have slightly different microbial communities. So, you know, uh, you know, eating different batches, eating different kinds of fermented foods are definitely all strategies for improving biodiversity. 
as I said earlier in relation to the apples, you know, I think that, you know, it's the, you know, different, um, um, you know, different vegetables from different farms is really going to have greater implications for biodiversity than different people making the, 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 uh, making the ferments, yeah. although the people will certainly have some amount of influence over it. But like, if you're making different ferments, like you don't have to go buy ferments that somebody else made to get more biodiversity. As long as you're eating some different batches or different kinds of fermented foods, you're getting plenty of fermented biodiversity. Green, fermented dairy, fermented vegetables, fermented fruits, right? I mean, you want to be, as always, getting the breadth of the depth of the yeah. Diversity. And I guarantee that if you're making all those different things, you're going to want to taste everybody else's fermented things because you're you're going to be really tuned into the subtle differences and and, you know, how much, you know, culinary creativity really comes into it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, the more the more different things you're making for yourself, the more you're going to just end up wanting to taste other people's things. Beautiful. All right. Well, we run out of time. We have questions left, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll respect the respect the structure. Um, thank you very much. Are any any parting words of wisdom or insights or or comments you'd like to leave? Well, us? I just want to you know thank you thank you for for this uh, uh, opportunity to be here. I, I see there's one there one question that ended up in our chat here. How is the microbiome of a farm being measured? I mean. You know, I mean, I think very similar to the ways that the microbiome of, you know, our bodies is being measured, but, but generally the way science is evaluating biodiversity in microbial communities is through genetic analysis, you know, PCR um, um, uh, genetic analysis. And so, you know, for the human microbiome, it, they would need a, a stool sample. And for the soil microbiome, you know, it would just require soil samples, uh, um, you know, from, from around a farm, you know, just, just like, you know, the way people get, uh, you know, send a soil sample to find out, you know, the, the mineral balance of, of, of yeah. soil. And, and I've, I've had been having conversations back and forth with people about those PCR tests and soil. And, you know, if you take a soil sample and you put it in a bag um, and you put it in the mail, uh, three days later, it's probably going to be an entirely different community of microbes in that soil when it gets to the PCR than was actually on the root of the plant when you pulled it out of the ground. So there's some serious questions there about logistics and like, do you have to freeze dry the soil? for instance, to maintain that microbiome so that you can actually see what was going on. Um, well, I think that, you know, the methodologies are, are you know, are, are new and they evolved. are, they are certainly evolving. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and, you know, I just want to say like, I, you know, I, I hope that this time has, you know, demystified this process a little bit for people, you know, fermentation is something that is, you know, such a part of the culinary landscape and of our, our, our everyday um, um, eating. Um, and yet so many people have just become terrified of it because it involves bacteria. And so, um, you know, I hope that, um, um, you know, I've been able to demystify it to some degree. And I hope I've gotten some people who hadn't thought about trying to ferment things at home in their kitchens to Think about giving it a try. Fermentation is not rocket science. And, um, you know, my, my books try to make it easy. Lots of other people's books. You can just like look on the internet and find plenty of information to get started. But, um, you know, just 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 try it. And, and I think that it can really, um, you know, really help people. I mean, it can help people's health, but it can also help people just tune in more to, um, you know, the microbial environment. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, you're an evangelist um, with a great, a great calling. So thank you. <laughs> thank great. you. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. You well. Great. Okay.